right. All right. As usual, we'll start out with prayer requests as you're thinking of those and coming up with those or have those. Um, one note of admin here. Um, there is a lot here. This is actually, believe it or not, this is the last lesson in the book. Uh, I was shocked. Um, but there is a lot here, and I don't like to typically do this unless I have to, but I'm going to split this one up for a couple reasons. Number one is there is a lot here. And to tie up the finality, uh, the final of the book, um, I don't want to rush through it and miss it. The other reason, and this is why this, I really hesitate to split it up, but next week I'm probably going to be in San Diego. And then the following weekend is the children's Sunday school program. So the f to finish this up will probably be the 19th, which would work out well because I'm possibly going to Japan on the 27th of December. So um, I will keep you posted, but as of now, I hate to split it up, but I'm not going to rush through this. We may even finish a little early. If we finish early, so be it. Um, you guys can have more time to fellowship and all that. Um, but I don't want to rush through it. It, it, it. For me, it's been a good study. I hope it has been for you as well. And um, there's no reason to rush through it. I want us to get, get all that, that God has for us and all that he has in the book here. So... Um, as we get ready to take prayer requests, of course, remember to, to pray for Dave Smith and, and for Dan Sasek as they're going through their treatments. Don't forget to pray for Miriam. Um, she's getting ready to have knee surgery. So obviously, um, that, that's important as well. So both her and Dave are going through some things there. I'm sure we could probably, uh, we'll talk with Pastor. There may be meals needed and things like that. I believe her surgery is the 16th. So um, pray for her as well. Uh, it's good to have Butch with us. He always has your, you pray for his sister, Jane, with the cancer. So it's good to see him with us this morning. As I mentioned, uh, Will Gaskell um, with the pneumonia, non-COVID related is my understanding. Um, and then uh, some issues with some cysts on, on his kidneys or what have you. Um, Dee, how are you doing with the knee? Continue to pray for Dee's knee. She twisted it well, a couple week or a week and a half ago now. Um, pray for her. Um, Pray for this time of year. I mean, there's folks that have lost loved ones. For some, it's, 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 it's another year. For some, it's the first year. It's never easy, but we know the first year without folks is, is difficult. Um, Thursday's or Wednesday's um, time here for the praise service was um, quite touching and emotional at, at times. But it's good to remember those folks. Uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't help but think, and I don't want to put her on the spot, but Dee was talking about making pies, and she learned it from her mom. The day before, I had just made Sloppy Joes with Charles, who I learned from my grandmother. So it, while it chokes us up and it gets us, you know, emotional, praise the Lord for those memories. My dad used to always say it. We'd do stuff as kids, and we'd do stuff, we'd mainly camping and things like that. And my dad would always say, we're making memories. And so my kids know that as well. Every, everything, you know, and sometimes like, oh, do I have to go do it? And then after you're done, it's like, man, there's another memory. Then, of course, we get older and we start forgetting them, but <laughs> um, but it was a good service. Any other prayer requests? Okay. So Ron's mom will have the biopsy. Yeah, Butch. Was this recent? Mm. All right, so this, so this fellow retiree, John, came down with COVID, was in a coma. His wife passed away while he was in the coma, and then he passed away, so neither, neither one of them. It's, it, it, it's why I asked when it was, because it's very, very similar to, to Carolina's friends that that happened to. Um, listen, pray for wisdom and pray for this... Um, Anybody that follows the stock market saw that it wasn't Black Friday. It was Bloody Murder Friday. And um, all because there's 100 cases of another variant down in South Africa. So pray for wisdom and, and pray for protection and all that. It's, I don't know. Very well may be the end times. So pray for revival and, and, uh, and, and be found faithful. 
Anything else? Yes. Ernie. I heard about, yes. And what's her friend's name? All right, so that's a, f a friend, Dina, 25, possible MS. Yeah, I he we heard about um, Ernie Moore. We kind of, we knew his father, I think, or knew of his, the son. Right. And that was him, right? That's the one. How old was his, how old was? Okay, so Ernie Moore Sr., who, yeah, had got COVID and just passed away. Yep. So um, I think Ed Wenzel's son-in-law, grandparents go to that church, I think. So, okay. Okay. So anyway, Ernie Moore Sr. passed, passed away from COVID. Um, listen, it's still serious stuff. So we need to be prudent. Anything else? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the privilege and opportunity to come into your house. We're thankful for all the many blessings. We're thankful for this time of season where we can give thanks, and we've heard many times that we should be thankful all the time, and your word tells us to give thanks in everything, but I pray that you help us to have that spirit and that attitude. We pray for these many requests. We continue to pray for those that are going through treatments, and we pray that they'll be completely effective, and uh, Dave Smith and Dr. Sastic and others will be restored to complete health. We think of uh, Butch's sister, Jane, with cancer, that you'll be, be with her as well. Be with Miriam with this upcoming knee surgery, knee replacement, that you'll uh, help her to have a, a successful surgery, that the recovery and rehab will be, will be quick, and that she'll be back to, uh, on her feet and pain-free soon. We do ask that you'll be with Ma uh, Ron's mom with his upcoming biopsy. We pray your will will be done there, guide and direct. Uh, we do pray for these, uh, this uh, couple that, that Butch mentioned, the, the uh, John that passed away and his wife and Lord I pray that you'll just be with the families there comfort them and and meet the need be with uh, Ernie Moore's family uh, with his recent home going we pray that you'll just uh, meet the needs in that family as well and for this young lady Adina only 25 I pray that as she gets tested for MS that uh, it'll not be the case but your will would be done and I pray that you'll just work in her life we just ask now that you'll be with the other many requests some that haven't been mentioned we're thankful for all that you've done for us in Jesus name amen if you turn in your Bibles to Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 28 to 30, we're going to start, we're going to finish up where we started, if that makes any sense. This end of the book, this end of the study is letter G, and it's keeping your soul quiet, keeping your soul quiet. We've talked about many times, we talked about it at the beginning of the study, that there's noise everywhere. And some of it uh, is just the world we live in, but we identify that I'm not going to do a rehash and do all of the different. We understand that there's noise and everybody has different noise. Some of it's the same noise. Some of it is noise that, that we allow to come in. Some of it is noise. But listen, God has the plan for all of the noise, whether it's Dave Smith's cancer or Dan Sastic's or, or uh, uh, Jane's cancer or whether it's Will Gaskin. God has the remedy for everything, whether physical or spiritual. And so whatever the source of your noise is, we don't really want to focus. It's good to identify the noise. And that was the very first, one of the very first things we did was realize that there's noise. And then to identify what that noise is, what that source is. Dave Smith couldn't get treated and get the right course of treatment until the doctor figured out exactly what was wrong. And so everybody in here, again, everybody in here has noise. So I've said many times, we shouldn't, and we should try to reduce it with the Lord's help, but don't feel like we're a failure as a Christian or we're some inferior. Paul had noise. Peter had noise. Every single person sitting in here this morning and every single person watching, trust me, you have noise in the soul. The question is, what do we do with it? So we talked about the way down or the path down, all the things that the noise, the effect it has, all of the different uh, negatives with the noise. But then thankfully, the second half is the way up or the way back. So we started out in Matthew 11, 
28 to 30. If you're there, here's what it says. And it's a very familiar passage. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest under your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, one of the things we have to keep in mind here is that prior to this time, Christ was going to, to the Jews. He was, he was preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was talking to the Jews as a nation corporately. But here, this is the new message, if you will. This is shifted from corporate to individual. This, McGee puts it this way. He says, it's like coming out of a blizzard into the warmth of a spring day. Like passing from, from a storm to a calm. Like going from darkness into light. And, and this is now coming from corporate to individual. Now, he's still, he's not forsaking the Jews, so don't misunderstand. But it's now personal. He's not saying to just the nation. He's not saying it's going corporate to individual. It's going national to personal. And if you look at this passage, it talks about, come unto me. So that's his invitation. That's his call. That's the invitation to come unto him. Why? And who does he want? All ye that labor and are heavy laden. So labor there is really to grow weary or to be beaten down. You don't have to raise your hands, but how many feel beaten down right now? For a host of reasons. Listen, COVID, we've talked about COVID a lot, of course, because it's right out there in the forefront. But I dare say people were beaten down before COVID. People, we had noise in the souls before COVID. COVID just was a, uh, is a really, really big, loud noise, right? But we had noise before this. So here's the answer. He says, come unto me, and that's the invitation, all ye that labor or are beaten down, that are weary and are heavy laden. That's those that are burdened down. Think of a, of a, of a ship with a, with a load. What did they do during the storms back then? They, they got rid of some of the burden. They got rid of some of the load because the ships, that's what it has the idea of. It says, and I will give you rest. So we have the invitation here, and he's saying, I will give you rest. It's not something we work up ourselves. And then he goes on to say, take upon me, I'm sorry, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So we've got some responsibility here. We've got some actions. We can't just sit around and just pray, which is important. And expect everything to work out. Now, God works it that way sometimes. But my point here is that we have to do our part. Now, I'm not saying work for salvation, but I'm saying God expects us to come unto him. Now, listen, I don't think anybody listening to me this morning or watching or anybody that's living and breathing right now isn't that are labor and are that are and have a heavy burden. So this is really speaking to everybody. Now, the most important and first burden that somebody has is what? Burden of sin. So he's talking here about salvation. He says, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So in this passage, he's really talking about the come unto me is, is, and give you rest, that's salvation. But then take my yoke upon you, learn of me, and you'll find rest for your souls. That's sanctification. Have you ever, had, have you ever heard or said yourself or heard people say, it's just, it's just too much, I, I, it's too much, I got to quit. We're not resting. See, sanctification is, is right there with salvation. People, how, how are you saved? By faith. Well, how are you sanctified? By faith. And it, take, it does take our, our effort. It reminded me of 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved. We don't learn things. Whatever profession you're in, Dr. Sasek didn't learn how to be a doctor just because he prayed and said, Lord, I, make me a doctor. He puts time and effort into it. Or any other profession that we have here. And so it does take work. I've read this to you before, but, and I don't know where I got it, but I've had this written in here for a long time. It says, pray as if everything depends on God and work as if everything depends on me. We have to put, put as you've heard many times, put feet to the prayers. 
So one of the first truths we learn in this book is that God, Jesus Christ, loves and delights in saving people. We've seen the theme repeated throughout the study. We have learned that he is a merciful God wanting to rescue us from our miserable conditions. The first and foremost is a condition of sin, but any other miserable condition as we go through this life. He is a loving God wanting to give us what is in our best interest, even at personal sacrifice. And one thing should be clear to us. He loves being known as our Savior. And that's where we get this passage again. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. All of us are laboring. All of us are heavy laden at a time. But God promises, I will give you rest. And so let's look at a couple of things with this passage. So the first thing we're going to see, number one, is maintaining a quiet soul. Now listen, we found out what the problem is. And we found out all these other things about God and His character. And here is keeping our souls quiet. Because listen, hopefully we can move on and we don't just forget this study, not because it has anything to do with me, but because it's these truths that have been taught from the Word of God, from His book, bringing it out, that we don't leave here and go, I hope that our souls are quieter moving forward than they are today. That's, that's what I would want. So keeping our soul, what's the first thing? Maintaining a quiet soul requires a Savior. How many things does the world turn to? And frankly, some Christians turn to to quiet the noise and the noise just gets louder and louder. Or we have relief for a few few moments, but then we return back to reality and, and the noise is still there and just as loud. So letter A, any attempt to solve life's problems apart from the knowledge of and a relationship with Jesus Christ will result in failure. You ever heard when people are witnessing to others or they, you hear them say, man, I'm just trying so hard. And you'll hear somebody say, stop try, trying and just trust. Well, everything that we try, try. Now, listen, again, we have to temper that. God gives us our responsibilities. Don't misunderstand me. There's God's sovereignty and man's responsibility. I don't fully understand it, but the Bible teaches it. But the first thing we have to see here is that anything we try to do, if we try to solve it on our own, it's going to end up in failure. And I'm sure that if we had time, people would give testimony after testimony where I tried and tried, and when I finally gave it over to the Lord, wow, look at that. His way works. It, it, it is that simple, um, but sometimes we think it can't be that simple. And yet, sometimes the answer is very simple. Very simple. Secondly, Anything we turn to apart from him, there's a typo, in order, that should be in, anything we turn to apart from him in order to make life work is another small letter savior or a competing God. Anything we turn to other than him is an idol. It's a competing God. We say, and, and we have this mindset, oh no, idols are those little things, those, those little statues, those little stone things, those little wood carvings. No, an idol is anything we put in place of God. And that could be, that could be a good thing. That could, uh, as far as, let me, let me quantify that. It could be a good thing in our life like our spouse. But if our spouse, if we're putting our spouse ahead of God, then we've got a problem. And so um, we need to keep in mind that we, when we go through the challenging times, we shouldn't just distract our minds with entertainment or even lean on others for solutions. But we should lean on, on the Lord. Amen. Now, praise the Lord for that spouse. Praise the Lord for that person that God has put in your life that you can rely on, that you can trust, that you can help, that friend, that pastor, that, that, that whoever, that, that sibling. But when we're going through life's trials and challenges, it's more than just simply being distracted. It's getting the answer. So Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 is an invitation from a loving master to be, to be a continued savior to his people. He wants us to come to him so that he can show his strength through our weakness. I hope that through this study, uh, the, dispos the disposition of a wonderful God to, you, to us is, is evident. He wants to be our loving, merciful, wise, and powerful savior. And it, 
it's not just a, if, if that's all we have, what more do we need? But as we've just celebrated Thanksgiving, look at all the other many things that God has given us and put in our lives that we can be thankful for. And we typically only look at the good, but we got to remember COVID for some reason is for our good and his glory. That's just what the Bible teaches. How we reconcile that is, 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 is between us and the Lord as far as how he works. Um, but let's move to the next one. Turn, in, turn your Bibles to James 1. James 1, 21 to 25 says this. It's a very familiar passage. I used to use it all the time with Iwana kids. And, and my kids as well. But James 1, 21 to 25 says this, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now remember, James' gospel, or James' uh, epistle is not teaching a works gospel. James is showing and teaching that Faith, real true faith, is going to be evident by what we do and how we act. So number two, maintaining a quiet soul requires saturation. So the first one was Savior. This is saturation. It's the discipline of meditation. Now, we think of meditation and we think of sitting on a yoga mat and our eyes closed and, and doing this and, and, and you know, you think, oh, well, I'm not a meditator. We meditate on things all the time. And what I mean by that is, is how many people, you don't have to raise your hand, how many people have ever worried about anything? How many people are worrying about something right now? You're meditating. Meditating is simply thinking on it, pondering it. So, the Apostle James here instructs us about the necessity and the components of meditating on the Word of God. Again, I go back to 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2. Study to show thyself approved. It takes work. And I fear that sometimes in our society, we're, we're, we're lazy Christians sometimes. We want the quick microwave answer. We want the quick, we want it right away without putting the work into it. I'm guilty of it sometimes. I'm not going to stand up here and lie. This passage teaches, first of all, that meditation requires concentration. Meditation requires concentration. Where it says, whoso looketh into the, look at that verse, it says, whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. So, to be a doer, and not just a, we have to be one that looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And what does that mean? That word looketh is the Greek word parakupto, and it really means to lean over or to peer intently into. It's kind of like when your grandchildren are watching Winnie the Pooh, and you don't dare get between them and the TV. And I'm sure you have pictures as well where they're sitting on the, on the, on the couch, and they're just like this. And you can have a nuclear explosion over here, and they're still like this. Yeah, no, don't speak to them. <laughs> They'll either not hear you. Well, that's true. If you, want, if you want something, they don't hear you. If you're too loud, they hear you, and they want you to pop up. You're a little loud. All right, all right. It's kind of like if somebody loses, I don't wear contacts because I, I just, I'm, a, I'm an eye wimp. I couldn't even put them in if I, if I wanted to. But think about if you've ever lost a, a, a contact and somebody that's down on the floor, hands and knees, and somebody comes, no, stop, stop. And you're intently looking on that floor for that, for that um, contact. Or any other thing you might in, be intently looking for. 
That's the idea here. The idea, it describes a diligent search and intensity that meditation involves. See, I've said many times, I'm guilty of it as well. It's great to read through our Bibles, but how many of us really spend time studying to show ourselves approved? I, I, the Bible commands us to look intently. That's why I think that it's so important that, and we're going to see it, we won't get to it this week, but when we finish up, and get down further into it, you'll see. And I'm going to have a handout uh, for everybody as well from the book. But it's, it, we sit here and read this, but whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And if we don't really study and meditate on these things and find out what they mean, we don't get the full meaning. So I, I for me, per, I, there's a lot of passages that as, as I've studied Sunday school lessons, I said, man, I've read that 100 times. Maybe not 100, but I've read that 25 times. I've read that 30 times. And then when you sit there and you break it down, now listen, I'm not going to lie, it takes work. But we make time for sports, and we make time for family, not that we shouldn't, and we make time for work, and we make time for all these other things, and yet we wonder why the noise isn't going away. It's because we're not following the prescribed medication. Listen, if we want the noise, if we want to quiet our souls, it is going to take some work and effort. Very little comes, you know this, I'm preaching, very little comes aside of hard work. Meditation is not the quick overview of a, quote, drive-by devotional. It is the purposeful, intentional search for the knowledge of God and His ways when we open our Bible and read it. We read with purpose of hearing something from God so that we can then go do it. As we talked about, I think, last week, the best end of our walk with God is to become a Christ-like doer of the work. That's what He wants. The best means for that is the purposeful search for an understanding of God and His ways. If we want to know what God thinks, we just got to go to His Word. So the object of that search is the Word of God. It is the only place we can find the truth about God and about how His world works. No other place are we going to get the truth that we will get from the Word of God. When our lives are full of noise, we have been living in a fantasy world made up of our own imaginations about what God is like and, at, and our own conclusions about how his world works. We saw that in one of the other lessons. If we have our idea of how God's world should work and it doesn't work that way, whose fault is that? It's ours. God tells us in his word how his word works, how his word works, how his world works, and he tells us how he expects us to live. If we don't follow what his word is teaching, what can we expect other than issues? We'll believe a lie, and, if we have, and as we have seen, the disintegration of that way of thinking is predictable. The goal of that search is a changed lifestyle so that you and I can be doers of the work. So meditation requires concentration, and meditation also requires continuation. Look what it says in James. Whoso looketh and continueth therein. I'd never seen that in this passage before. But whoso looketh, you're in, we're intently searching and continueth therein. What does it mean to continue in? How long do we continue? That's a good question. So if, if Paracupto, listen, you don't have to be a Greek scholar. I am not a Greek scholar. I took a couple semesters of Greek. I, I, I knew then enough to be dangerous. I haven't used it much, so, so I am nowhere near proficient. I'm sure I could pick it up uh, again if I needed to study it like Pastor does. But all you have to do is get a, get a Greek lexicon. And the idea of some of these words, God could illuminate to you and me so much more truth and so much just by simply having a Greek lexicon where you know and you look up that word uh, or Strong's Concordance. Man, what, is, what does looketh mean? What does continue with me? We, because we have our English, we have our own way of, and our own way we understand words. But 
I've used the example many, many times. Simply the word love in the Greek. In the Greek, there's three different words used for love. One of them is not used in the Bible, but there's phileo and there's agape. And that sim just simply, I challenge you, look up just the passage where Christ is talking to his disciples and he says, do you love me? And they say, yeah, we love you. Different words, but we only see love. And as you go through the path, so I don't know, did he ask him three times because he denied him three times? Maybe, but it's different words there. And we only see love. But if we see, oh, he, oh he's talking about agape. He's only talking about phileo. Just that one simple word. In English, we just use love. So simply an, an understanding, and listen, you don't have to be a Greek scholar. If you have a strong concordance, listen, tell somebody you want that for Christmas. And it gives you the numbers. You look in here, and it, oh, okay, that, that's the, and it gives you a, a number. You go back to the back, and it says, it'll tell you right in the back, oh, that's paracupto, and here's what it means. And it'll give you other areas. Sometimes it's very interesting to know where that word is used in another spot. Right, it, 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 right for that instance, sure, yeah. and and then there's and then you could find a word that's used. Let's say this word continueth, and I didn't look this up to see other areas, but that word could mean that same Greek word could be used in a different area and not translate it continueth, and so it gives you a, a, a much deeper meaning of what. Listen, any of us, listen. I think we should read our Bibles through. Does that make you super spiritual? No. But that's a good starting spot. But just simply reading through it, we're just, we're just reading the preface, if you will. We're not really, but as we, as we, you and I take time, we have to intently look into. And then we have to continue. So what does it mean to continue? How long should we continue with this passage? So, in Dr. Berg's life, as he was looking through this and praying, here's what, here's what came to him. The first answer is, look at the next part. He being not a forgetful hearer. How long should you and I continue trying to study and learn something? Well, part of it is until we're not a forgetful hearer. That kind of makes common sense, but how often do we just go through something and, you know, after Mike Schrock was here and that one thing he taught us for that verse, I thought, man, I'm going to stick with that. You know something? I've forgotten it. I'm just going to be honest. I would have to go back and look at the message online or whatever. But he, the way he was doing it, we had it memorized. I'm a forgetful hearer. Now, there are certain things that just stick with us. But how long should we continue? How long should we intently study? How long should we be intently looking into well, the first part is till we're not a forgetful hearer. We should continue meditating upon its truths and its applications until it has a sense of permanence in our lives. Now, there are many truths that, that are permanent in your life. I'm sure of that. There's many basic truths that you and I have been taught that we just remember and we know. But there's a lot that we still need to know. And so one of the things for continuation is a sense of permanence. He goes on to say this. He says, most of us know exactly what I'm talking about. We have been reading the scriptures and pondering a portion of it, knowing that there is something in that passage that God really wants us to know. After we have given it considerable thought, God begins to open our eyes and we see the truth with illuminated understanding. When that happens, we rarely forget the truth. We have seen the truth of it from God himself and the imprint upon our soul is powerful. Every time we come across that passage, our heart warms as we remember the work of God in our soul as, as we meditated upon His Word. God intends for His truth to have a profound effect upon our minds and hearts, but that will only come with intentional meditation. Listen, as great as it is to sit here and listen to Pastor's sermon, how many people, you don't have to raise your hand, how many people remember all the points from last week's sermon? Well, I'll start. I do not remember all of them, but I have the notes and that's an opportunity for us to go back. But there are certain things that that have stuck in my mind. 
of sermons I heard years ago. Why? I don't know. But this is, but again, this takes work. This takes effort. And he's telling us, he's given us the plan here. But whoso, if you and I intently peer into or look into the perfect law of liberty, and we do it until it becomes a sense of permanence in, a, in us, and, and we remember it, that's what he wants us to do. And there's yet another answer. How long do we continue into the passage? The second part is, here it is. But be a doer of the work. This man shall be blessed in his deed. So how long are we supposed to, this whole idea of meditation, of saturating ourselves. Listen, we saturate ourselves with the news, don't we? Some of us. We sat, there's times where Dawn and I have looked at each other and said, I, I mean, I can't take it anymore. i got to shut the news off. Or, or, we saturate ourselves with a lot of things, and I'm not saying they're bad. But what better thing to quiet the noise in our souls than to saturate ourselves and meditate on what God is trying to teach us? And listen, this goes for me too. I'm not standing up here and saying that I meditate and study this stuff all the time. Almost every time I stand up here, you feel unprepared. You feel like I should have studied a little bit longer. I should have read a little bit more. But we need to get to the point, first of all, where it's a sense of permanence. And secondly, that we get to the point where, listen, what good does it do if God teaches Tony a truth if he never acts upon it? Or me as well. Wonderful to know it, but once we've acquired the knowledge, it's just like knowledge and wisdom we talked about last week. We use them interchangeably sometimes, but they're not interchangeable all the time. You just look at the, some of this, the, the, uh, the synonyms that, that are used for those words. But we need to get to the point, so here it is, so that we're doers of the work, and what is this? That we're productive. God doesn't want a bunch of sideline Christians. He wants us to meditate. Listen, I'm just going to be honest. Why are we in the mess we're in today? I think it's for a long time we Christians have sat on the sidelines and, and been too quiet. And we've had apathy and we've been too, too comfortable and our boat hasn't gotten rocked. Well, what happens when they start shutting First Baptist Church of Elmer's YouTube channel down or Facebook because pastor said what he said this morning about homosexuality? He's speaking the truth and he's speaking it in love. But I believe that we're in this. I firmly believe that part of why some of it could be God's judgment. I, I, listen, we see the underside of it. God sees the plan up here. But part of the reason why we have what we're going on. Listen, what he said this morning about eight, 18 year olds. Exactly. It's exactly true. And how many times have we seen it? Don and I worked with Awana for 20, 20 plus years. And it's sad, but I can tell you it, it, it's, it's difficult to count on a couple of hands the young people that we can immediately say, man, they're still on fire and serving the Lord. Through every year of their Christian education and Christian school, it's almost the same way. I believe it's because we, all of us, have not taken this as serious as we should and meditated on these truths. And firmly, for, I think we've taken a lot of things for granted. Yes, we need to pray for revival, but what are we doing to help it come about? So we need to get to the point where we're not, we, we not only know the truth, and it's part of us, but we're actually a doer of the work. You know what? As many times as I've said to Awana kids or my kids, be doers of the word and not hearers only, it never clicked until this weekend studying this where it says, so that you can be a doer of the work. So you can be a doer of the work. Some people in this room have been doers of the work for a long, long time. I saw a doer of the work the other morning. I don't want to embarrass her, but how old are you, how old are you now? 94. 94. I went over and spent some time with her Saturday. You know what she was doing as soon as she got done eating breakfast? She was sitting in the log room reading her Bible. And I looked over. She didn't know it, but I took a picture. You know why? Because that's something I want to show my grandkids. 
and she's not perfect, and she'll tell you that, and she'll tell you I'm not perfect because we know that. But let me tell you something. At 94, still trying to saturate herself with the Word of God. And there's other people in this room that, that are doing the same thing. But if we don't do that, we're going to have noise in the soul. And I don't know about you, but I don't like the noise. We're going to have it, and we need to deal with it. But listen, turn over to 1 Timothy, and we'll get ready to close. I've said before, it's nice to see that Leona Wilson comes in with her grandkids. It's nice to see that Paul and Dee continually bring their grandkids to things. It's to teach them from a young age. And like I said, we can't take these things for granted. 1 Timothy 4, 15 and 16 says this, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Now granted, he's speaking to Timothy, but this could go to all of us. That thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. I said Wednesday night was at, at sometimes an emotional night. But it was also pretty joyful. For those that weren't here or didn't hear it, Sharon gave a testimony that their granddaughter got saved that morning. And it's not by accident. It's because they've been diligently putting their mind to this. And that's encouraging because I got two grandkids that I want to be able to some, at some point give that same testimony here. Whether it's Amanda or Dawn or whomever may be, I want to be able to have that same one. But it's not going to come by accident. I, I, I hope I'm the doer. No, I un yeah. And it doesn't matter as much what I say as what they see me doing. Carolina? You're reaping what you sowed. I think I've done that in Sunday school at one point. You guys know the the, um, the formula for reaping and sowing? You reap more than you sow. You reap later than you sow. You reap what you sow. Meditation should result in obvious spiritual impact that others can see. You ever have a grandchild that starts acting up because they've been watching the wrong cartoon for too long. They start, st listen, when I, when I was a kid, we used to, mom and dad used to take, turn the wrestling off on Saturday mornings because us kids were jumping off the couch onto each other and we, we emulate what we spend time with. And meditation should result in obvious spiritual impact that others can see. Dr. Berg puts it this way. He says, the process not only will profit us as it transforms our lives, but it will profit others who will be convicted, encouraged, and instructed by our lives as they are changed by the process of meditation on the Word. None of us are perfect. But hopefully we're doers of the Word and doers of the work and as Fred said, we're that example. So that's the challenge this morning. See, even if I wasn't going to be gone, we wouldn't, never, we wouldn't have gotten through it all. But hold the paper in a couple of weeks, unless, I, unless my San Diego trip gets canceled. We will finish this up. And trust me, there's a lot of more good information here to, to finish up to help keep our souls quiet. Any other questions or comments? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all that you've done for us. I pray that you help us to apply your word, to study your word, to meditate, to apply it, to not to be doers, but not to be hearers, but doers, 
and to be doers of your work as well. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. Oh, way south, Sasebo. Yeah, even, even if, well, okay, even if, um, even if I was to just go to 